Welcome to chapter five, part one. We're talking about viruses in this chapter. So when we're talking about the big picture here, viruses infect every type of cell, including bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, plants, and animals. Seawater can actually contain 10 million viruses per milliliter. That's not gonna be a test question, but it's just kind of like a fun fact kind of thing. So um, for many years, the cause of viral infections was unknown. Louis Pasteur actually hypothesized that rabies was caused by a living thing smaller than bacteria. And keep in mind, this is back when they're just discovering, you know, that diseases are caused by something rather than just, you know, your, your meanness or your evilness. Um, so uh, he also proposed the term virus, which is Latin for poison. So these two guys, uh, I've, Ivanovsky, Ivanovsky, I'm sorry, um, these guys showed that disease in tobacco was caused by a virus. And then Loeffler and Frosch discovered an animal virus that causes foot and mouth disease in cattle. So these researchers found that when fluids from the host organisms passed through a porcelain filter that was designed to trap bacteria, the filtrate remained infectious. So they discovered that viruses were smaller than bacteria. Um, they filtered right on through. So this proved that infection could be caused by a fluid containing agents smaller than bacteria. So questions about viruses, are they organisms? Are they alive? What role did viruses play in the evolution of life? What are their biological characteristics? How can particles so small and simple and seemingly insignificant be causing disease and death? And what is the connection between viruses and cancer? So we're going we're gonna to kind of talk about these in the upcoming slides here. So there's two sides of the debate. Since viruses are unable to multiply independently from the host cell, they are not living things and should not be called, in, uh, or should be called rather, infectious molecules. So that's that's kind of one side. The, the other side is even though viruses do not exhibit most of the life processes of cells, they can direct them and thus are certainly more than an inert and lifeless molecule. So, you know, you will hear me say no, that viruses aren't alive. And it's just because of how I learned it and because there's no real definitive statement the other way around. So, um, they are not alive. They are um, either um, active or inactive. Um, and until something comes out definitive, I'll probably keep, keep saying that. But I, I do understand both sides of this debate and both of these statements for sure. So um, generally speaking, we're going to say that they are active or inactive instead of alive or dead. <clears throat> So as far as evolution goes, um, viruses um, infect cells and influence their gene genetic makeup. They shape the way cells, tissues, bacteria, plants, and animals have evolved. 8%, 8%, okay, taking that number of the human genome of our genetics consists of sequences that come from viruses. 10 to 20% of bacterial DNA contains viral sequences. So you know, when you really think about that, you know, you could say we're part virus. <laughs> um, but um, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting fact. So obligate intracellular parasites, that's what these guys are. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites in that they cannot multiply unless they invade a host cell, a specific host cell, and instruct its genetic and metabolic machinery to make and release new viruses. So what viruses are, uh, you'll hear me say that they're like pirates or they're hijackers. Um, they can't multiply on their own. They can't get, get what they need done on their own. But once they get into a host cell, they can basically use all the machines in the host cell to copy its um, either DNA or RNA and um, make new viruses, make all the parts for new viruses. So it's it's very excuse me, it's very interesting um, the way viruses work and a little scary, but the more you know, the better off you are as far as educating yourself on, the, on these. 
So properties of viruses, um, they're obligate intracellular parasites, like I said, um, but they of either, you know, animals or humans, um, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, algae, and plants. So they can, they can um, take uh, refuge in any of those types of cells. There's an estimated 10 to the 31st virus particles on Earth, approximately 10 times the number of bacteria and archaea combined. They, viruses are ubiquitous in nature and have had major impact on the development of biological life. They are ultra microscopic in that it, we can't see them with just a regular microscope. You have to have specialized microscopes um, to see them. Um, they are not cells. Uh, but they're compact and economical. They they have they're they're very frugal in what they do. They 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 only carry with them what they absolutely need to assure that they can duplicate. They can become duplicated. They do not independently fulfill the characteristics of life, and their basic structure consists of a protein shell, which we call a capsid, and that is surrounded or surrounds the nucleic acid. Um, and we'll learn more about that as we, as we move on. The nucleic acid itself can either be DNA or RNA. It's not gonna have both in there. It will be either or, not both. The nucleic acids can be double-stranded, single-stranded, um, and a DNA or RNA respectively. Um, molecules on virus surfaces give them high specificity for attachment to a host. So that means that whatever is on the virus surface, like the spikes or whatever sticking off the virus surface, and we usually call them spikes, but um, those are very specific to um, certain hosts and also certain tissues in those hosts. So for example, if I just get the flu virus on my skin, it's not gonna give my skin the flu, right? Um, so my skin does not have the correct surface molecules um, to actually let that virus invade my skin cells. So um, we'll learn more about that. <clears throat> Viruses multiply by taking control of the host genetic material and regulating synthesis and assembly of new viruses, like a pirate taking over the ship and all the tools. Or if you go to a factory and you take over all the equipment and start making stuff. Um, it's, it's how it is. So, uh, viruses lack enzymes for most metabolic processes. However, viruses can have, um, can be, uh, contain an enzyme or two, but, um, not the enzymes you need for metabolic processes. Um, viruses also lack the machinery for synthesizing the proteins. So how they are classified in names for years, viruses were classified on the basis of just their hosts and the disease they caused. Now they include the host and disease they caused, structure, chemical composition, and similarities in genetic makeup. So there's eight order, orders and 38 families, um, and there's a bunch more that have not been assigned to any order. So viruses are the smallest infectious agents. Um, Smallest viruses are about 20 nanometers, and that would be parvovirus. Largest, herpes simplex, about 150 nanometers. So here are a uh, comparison uh, of sizes of viruses with um, bacteria and uh, yeast cells. So these are yeast cells right here, and then this is supposed to be like any e. coli, streptococcus, um, and then we get smaller and smaller, and you can see, um, I think there is, a, yep, these are all viruses here. And then this is a hemoglobin molecule all the way here, down here, just to show size comparison. You're not going to have to tell me a whole lot about that. I'm just showing it more as an interesting kind of fun fact. Um, all right, so um, viral components. So... I'm going to stop here and pick up on viral components in part two.